I'm Alicia Swayze. I'm the Reynolds Professor in Business Journalism here at Washington and Lee. It is my privilege uh, this evening to welcome our very distinguished writers, Walt Bogdanich and Michael Forsyth, investigative reporters at the New York Times. They are the co-authors of When McKinsey Comes to Town, The Hidden Influence of the World's Most Powerful Consulting Firm. We're going to have a conversation, and then we're going to leave plenty of time for your questions. But please, first, join me in welcoming them to Washington in Lee. Thank thanks, thanks for coming, guys. Good to see you. Thanks for having us. And we yeah, had thanks. a nice day for you. We rolled that out specifically case it was cold in New York. So. Um, I understand uh, from our conversations that you both have had a personal connection to McKinsey through your jobs. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, I'll begin with a story. Um, when I graduated from college, um, I desperately wanted to be a journalist. Watergate had just happened and everyone wanted to be the next, you know, person to save democracy and make the world a better place. The problem was I was a political science major and I had no experience in journalism. So after 30 rejections, not one of them an interview, um, I decided I had no choice but to go back to Gary, Indiana, which was not high on my list. Believe me, that's where I grew up. And I took a job in United States Steel, which at one time was the largest corporation in the world. And it didn't take long but one day really, to realize that I had entered an alien universe. You can't imagine what it was like to work in there. If for no other reason, beginning with the size, it was seven and a half miles long, two miles wide, <clears throat> 200 miles of railroad track. It had its own hospital, its own police force, own fire department. And around every corner was lurking danger, of unimaginable horrors. Um, people were asphyxiated, they were electrocuted, they drowned, they, they, were, they had tens of thousands of pounds of steel dropped on them. 41 people died from electrocution. So it was a dangerous place. And I learned that pretty, pretty early, my first summer there, uh, two workers in my unit died, one of whom was crushed by like 30,000 pounds of steel that was moving over his head, and it shouldn't have been, but was. Another one was burned alive by red hot uh, beam of steel. Um, so it was, it, was, it was a place you had to be very aware of your surroundings. Uh, I quit after two years because um, I wanted to use the money to start a small weekly paper in Gary, Indiana, which was a problem because newspapers need advertising. And there were no businesses in Gary, Indiana anymore. So I didn't kind of figure that out until a little bit too late. But uh, you know, I wanted to do a, write stories that, that the local big city, big city newspaper wasn't doing, the Daily, mm -hmm. which was hazards of working there, worker safety, the fact that this mill, although it provided you know, sustenance for the city and my family worked there as well, um, the, the dangers weren't being covered. I mean, the real story wasn't being covered. And I thought that going there, uh, I might be able to do that. The pollution was so bad that during one high school baseball game that I played in, they had to suspend it because soot and smoke blew over from the university, uh, from the university, from, from, the, from the, uh, yeah. the steel mill. Um, why am I telling you about U.S. Steel? Well, it's an interesting place to begin with, but that's not why I'm doing it. Because over the years, I came to learn that there was this mysterious company called McKinsey that had been advising them and played a big role in them becoming what they became. Mm -hmm. And over time, had taken the job of basically, as the, as the, as the steel industry suffered enormously from foreign comp competition, from poor management, from outdated equipment, they were brought in to sort of bring a rational approach to maintenance in a way that would save the, the company money. It was called the Carnegie Way, which is a, a McKinsey thing. 
they come up with these slogans and Carnegie was one of the founders of, of the company. Um, but in, you know, and they went around interviewing, which is what McKinsey does. They interviewed um, the workers um, and, and, and tried to find out what was going on there. First of all, let me tell you a little bit about McKinsey, it's, which is why we're here. Um, it is probably the most secretive company in the world. It advises the FBI, CIA, Pentagon, FBI, autocracies, democracies, and everything in between. They affect our lives in ways you can't even begin to imagine. But cutting expenses is McKinsey's calling card. And that's what they did at US Steel as, the, as the, 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 the mill was starting to break down as the equipment was really old. And what happened? The workers protested it. They said people are gonna die. And in fact, they did die. Two people were, were two workers were electrocuted. Outside the, the, one of the main gates, there's something, a book of the dead, where there's 600 names and descriptions of how people died inside the mill. And that did not capture all the people that died there. It is a, I never knew that. I grew up in, I didn't know that there was this book there. Nobody knew that. It's not something they advertise, because they don't want people to know that people are dying over there. Um, well, it what turned out it wasn't only US Steel. Um, that they were uh, advising on cost cutting. A very different kind of corporation was Disney, Disneyland. They went over there, this magical place of fantasy and you suspend your, you know, fire your imagination and it's a great place for kids to have fun. And what they did was they started cutting um, cost of cutting maintenance there just like they did at US Steel. Very different kind of company, but basically the same MO. Um, to, to cut expenses, the quickest way is, one of the quickest ways is to lay people off, fire them, um, or to cut expenses, or to cut maintenance. And that's what they did at Disneyland. And one of the things they did is they went to, in this rational scientific approach that they had, quote unquote, they again interviewed the people who worked there. And they said, you know, uh, We've, we've been looking at what's happening and we find that you are checking like the lap bars on these rides every day. And we find that n there's never been accidents there. And the answer was, there's no accidents because we check the lap bars mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. um, and sure enough, they cut maintenance and sure enough, people died. Little kid died, you know, families were injured um, horribly. Um, and that is part of McKinsey's legacy. Um, I worked at Disney. They owned ABC and I worked at ABC. So both of these companies had meaning to me. And I saw what McKinsey had done um, to them and to the people who work there. And, um, and that's my opening remarks, my opening story. I'll turn it over to Mike. Um, so my story is a little different. Uh, I've been a journalist uh, for about 23 years now. Um, but before I was a journalist, I was an officer in the US Navy. Uh, and uh, I get to tell you a little sea story. I don't get to do that too often, so I'm pretty happy about that. So I did a very unusual thing in the Navy. I served on ships. Um, <laughs> and uh, in 1994, I was serving on a guided missile cruiser, the USS Mobile Bay. And uh, it was forward deployed to Yokosuka, Japan, which Forward deployed is a euphemism for it goes, it's at sea all the time. And it's usually in the Persian Gulf or somewhere in between. Um, in October of 1994, um, I was the navigator uh, on this ship. So I was responsible for making sure we did not run aground, um, that we got into port and out of port safely, and that we went the right way, and among many other duties. Um, and uh, we were in the South China Sea. We were in Manila, um, a very popular place uh, for US Navy personnel. Um, and, uh, but we were going to sail from Manila to the island of Borneo, the northern part of the island of Borneo, uh, which is uh, owned by Malaysia, uh, to the, a port called Kota Kanabalu. So to do that, you have to transit the South China Sea. So we did. Um, I had been 
in the South China Sea several times before, but not as the navigator. And, I, and it was nighttime, and it was horrifying because we have a fathometer up on the bridge. And there was hardly any water under the keel. And I, and I just saw my career. You know, if you run aground as the navigator, it's a very bad thing for your career. <laughs> Um, and it's also a very bad thing for the, the commanding officer. He's, that's pretty much it for his career, too. So it wasn't just my, you know, 20-something career on the line. It was, you know, this very distinguished, gray-haired captain, you know, his career on the line, too. And I just couldn't believe the readings we were getting. And it, it was frightening. Um, luckily, I had a, you know, a senior enlisted guy, the chief, uh, senior chief petty officer, who you know, rest assured, you know, assured me, you know, we're not going to run aground. It's OK. I kept looking at the chart. It seems like there's enough water. But you know, we've got a sonar dome on these on most Navy ships, warships, you know, that even goes farther below. And I just was imagining some rock just tearing up that sonar dome. Didn't happen. We got to Borneo just fine. So the point of that little tiny sea story is that the thing I was worried about when we transited the South China Sea was the water beneath the keel. Nowadays, if you're a navigator on a guided missile cruiser or a US destroyer in the South China Sea, you have a whole different set of worries. And it's really not below the water. It's these new islands that weren't even there in 1994 when I was there. These brand new islands that are just made um, you know, by dredging the floor of this kind of shallow uh, sea. Um, it's deep in some places, but shallow in others. And these are, uh, islands are, were built by China, and they are big. Um, and nowadays, if you're an officer or you're anybody on a US Navy ship, you have to worry about being harassed by uh, Chinese Navy, Chinese Coast Guard airplanes, because they've basically militarized this area. This is becoming a Chinese lake. And that just was not the case you know, 30 years ago, less than 30 years ago. This was the farthest thing from my mind. I never thought about the Chinese Navy when I was going through the South China Sea uh, back in the 1990s. It's a different world. So the, of course, when the Chinese started building these islands around 2013, uh, you know, they assured the world, yeah, these are for peaceful purposes. You know, We're just going to have search and rescue operations there you know, in case of, ship runs into trouble, we'll, have, we'll be out there, we can help them out. So uh, September 25th, 2015, the world really learned then that that really just was not the case. Uh, uh, that's when uh, Jane's Defense Weekly reported that there was a two kilometer long airstrip on one of these brand new islands that just didn't exist before. Um, and the, the, really, the only thing that this would be good for, why do you have a two kilometer long airstrip? It's so you can land long range bombers. You know, Obviously, fighter jets would have no problem landing on that. And so the, the gig was up. We knew, you know, the world knew then that this area was being militarized. So this was September 25th, 2015. Now, I promise you there's a point to this story. Because on that very same day, 2,000 miles to the north in Beijing, there was a big meeting of one of these big, gigantic Chinese state-owned companies. So there's a hierarchy of companies in China. And there's about 100 companies um, that are owned by the Chinese government and that are also managed from the center, from Beijing. The bosses of these companies are appointed by the organization department of the Chinese Communist Party. And one of these companies is called China Communications Construction Company. And China Communications Construction Company owns the dredging company that built most of these islands. And there was a giant ship called the Tianjin Hao, which sucked up a million gallons of sand a minute to deposit to make these islands. It was owned by this company. And like I said, I promise you there's a point to this. There's a punchline here. Because at that meeting on the 25th of September, 2015, McKinsey was there. McKinsey had been hired by China Communications Construction to advise them on you know, big strategy plans, the future of their business, which clearly included dredging. They were talking about having a stock market listing, all these things now. So McKinsey was there. And this, you know, to a former Navy officer, was pretty alarming uh, you know, when I look back. Because uh, the idea of McKinsey, which was formed in Chicago in 1926, 
reputation of working with Fortune 500 companies, companies around the world, kind of being a, you know, a guardian of capitalism, a, an advisor to the CEOs and the CFOs and the CEOs of the world, and the idea that they were working with a state-owned company in China, a state-owned company that was building islands that were causing great pains and great consternation in Washington uh, with the Pentagon uh, was a, is a bit jarring. It's, it's a bit jarring. And uh, it turns out you know, there's a problem there, too, because a far bigger client for McKinsey than the Chinese state-owned companies, uh, and McKinsey's worked for a lot of those, uh, is the Pentagon. Um, so on the one hand, uh, McKinsey's advising the Pentagon and on all sorts of things. Um, you know, aircraft from, you know, for, for logistics, uh, just a myriad things. And on the other hand, they're advising a Chinese company that is, has a mission which is at complete odds uh, with the Pentagon and, uh, and the United States strategy. And it's a conflict. It's certainly, uh, we were the ones to uh, kind of bring this to the world a few years ago. Uh, it's a big deal in Washington now. Um, there's a lot of concern over that. Uh, I think this is not unique, though, to China. The, the idea, and this is a big part of our book, uh, is to look at uh, McKinsey's work with authoritarian countries around the world. So we also focus on their work with Saudi Arabia uh, for an entire chapter. Uh, but McKinsey also worked um, with the Russian government uh, closely. And one thing I wish we had written more about in this book, but we did write about for the newspaper, was its work uh, with, in Ukraine. Um, for not the current uh, President Zelensky, but for that guy who was deposed back in 2014, that fabulously corrupt pro-Russian um, uh, president. Yanukovych. Yanukovych. And uh, uh, the idea that he was working with, that McKinsey was working with them, advising on the, uh, the, his economic policy, um, uh, you know, is, is jarring. And McKinsey does this ar around the world with, with authoritarian and corrupt governments. So it's, it works with companies around the world. It works with governments around the world, and not only with democracies, but also with autocracies. Um, and it's a major part of our book, and I think I'll leave it up to you now. Well, I'm curious, and I think a lot of people would ask, so were those experiences what motivated you to spend four years of your lives investigating McKinsey, or, or, or why, did, why did you guys decide to do the book? Well, I've been concerned for some time, as have uh, many others in this country, about the income inequality and the toxic effect it has on our society and the divisions that have been created by it, a feeling that people are getting, getting by, and are taking advantage of the system in ways that others can't. And, and it's, it's tearing the country apart. And uh, I, I had heard that McKinsey had played a role in some of this. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to look at it. Uh, I didn't know anything about McKinsey. Journalists knew nothing about McKinsey. It was an impossible uh, company to pierce because every employee had to find a, sign an NDA, non-disclosure agreement. Every employee, when, upon taking uh, the job, had to promise never to disclose clients or the advice that they gave them or how much money they got. It was a total secret operation. So that was a challenge and intimidating to, to, to look at it. But I wanted to know more about how, what exactly McKinsey did, how it contributed to, to income inequality. And what I discovered and we discovered was that in 1950, there was this landmark um, contract agreement signed by the UAW and McKinsey, not UAW and General Motors. And you know, it was, it was, you know, basically a passport for, the, for United Auto Workers to join the middle class. There were pensions, there were vacations, there was stability. Um, it, was a, it was a landmark agreement and the other two uh, major automakers joined it. Well, at some point, um, General Motors started to worry that, yeah, maybe the workers are making too much money. Maybe they're catching up to what we're making. And maybe the executives should be aware of what's happening. And they commissioned McKinsey to do a study 
of dozens of corporations looking at the pay structure, looking at what the workers were making versus the executives. And yes, they came to the conclusion that the gap was narrowing. And at that point, so began sort of the arms race to the top to see who could make the most money. And McKinsey helped you know, smooth the way for that through um, advising companies on outsourcing, on laying off, on stock options, on all these different maneuvers to, to, to make the rich richer at the expense of the communities, at the expense of the com companies and uh, the, the products that they're supposed to be making and the workers ultimately. And back in 1950, um, the average uh, worker, ma uh, executive made 30 times a production worker's uh, pay. Now, 350 times. Um, it's, an issue, it's an issue that I wanted to know more about and I thought looking into McKinsey helped me understand it better. Yeah. You wanna to add to that? You know, I think Walt well, said it best. I, you know, one thing I'll say just as the, the, for the reporting process, you know, so Walt had been thinking about doing this for a few years and he, he asked me to, to help him out starting in uh, 2018 and the first story we did was focused on South Africa. But in that story, uh, and, and there's the corrupt, there's just, McKinsey worked hand in hand with uh, some very, you know, got in the middle of a very big corruption scandal in South Africa, which wound up bringing down the president. Um, and McKinsey now is actually under a criminal indictment in South Africa for its, its work uh, um, in that country. Um, but in that, we, we put a few sentences about their work with um, ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement. Mm -hmm. just, just noting the fact that they made some money, they had this contract. We didn't really have a lot of details. That set off a firestorm at McKinsey, within mm -hmm. McKinsey. We started writing about that a little bit. That begat more stories. We started writing about McKinsey's work with authoritarian countries. And then following year, and this would have been in 2019, uh, you know, we had thought and we had written in 2018 that the biggest scandal ever to befall McKinsey was their work in South Africa. They, they wound up having to pay back more than $100 million. Mm -hmm. um, and now, very recently, they've had this criminal charge. But that was quickly supplanted in 2019 when the world learned, we were writing about furiously, McKinsey's work with Purdue Pharma and its work to help to turbocharge opioid sales, um, OxyContin sales um, at Purdue Pharma. That begat more stories and it just, mm -hmm. it just kept going. And to carry forward the theme of conflicts of interest, as Mike pointed out, with the Pentagon and, and Chinese Communist Party, you know, um, that they could be working on both sides. I mean, the, one of the tragedies and one of the reasons why the OxyContin situation got so out of control with Purdue Pharma is that McKinsey was at the same time advising Purdue Pharma as it was its regulator, the Food and Drug Administration. And it went way beyond Purdue Pharma. They, McKinsey advised every single major pharmaceutical company, every one of them. And they saw no problem at the same time with advising the Food and Drug Administration. What's the result of that? Well, McKinsey said that it's not really a conflict of interest because we don't share notes or anything. Okay, I think any reasonable common sense person would look at that and say, that's wrong, that's dangerous, that's not how it should work. You have two competing interests, you shouldn't have the same firm advising them, but they do. Let's stick with uh, the pharmaceutical okay. example because frankly, it takes a lot to shock me. That was a really disturbing chapter because as the nation was struggling to figure out what are we gonna do with something like, about the fact that 750,000 people had died of overdoses of opioids. They were, as you said, advising these companies how to turbocharge sales. Their, their words. Not only that, they were advising, suggesting on ways to circumvent mm -hmm. efforts by the federal government to stop this crisis through, through better oversight of, of the pharmacy, of uh, drug distributors, the pharmacies themselves, and McKinsey was saying, well, maybe we could have an alternative, an alternate delivery system that would circumvent all that. Oh, come on. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were doing things that now they recognize were wrong, which is why they decided to, to pay more than $600 million to settle government investigations. But they always append the statement, but we did nothing wrong. Mm 
Mm. Well, you don't pay $600 million if you did nothing wrong. You don't pay $100 million in South Africa to, 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 the, uh, to a country that has some of the worst income inequality in the world if you haven't done something wrong. But that's how they operate. They throw out money when they get in trouble, and they have the money to kind of buy this reputation that they have. It, and correct me if I'm wrong, what they did was they specifically targeted or told the, the pharmacies and the doctors, let's target the heaviest users and prescribers because it was well known, of course, you know, you, you give doctors junkets and things like that to help them, you know, incentivize them to sell your drugs. But they went above and beyond that. Even when, you know, the nation is realizing we, we have a really big problem. Oh, it's a the massive problem. And of course, that triggered all the things that are, ha a, lot, a lot of what's happening now with, with fentanyl and heroin. And I mean, it's just, it's just uh, the damage that, that's done. You can't put it all on McKinsey's doorstep, but they work for this company that triggered you know, this, this abuse. And, and, and I'll just say something very briefly. Um, McKinsey turned um, selling, uh, advising companies that sold addictive products into a profit center. Mm -hmm. They were not only um, advising uh, opioid companies, more than just Purdue Pharma, as we discovered, Mike and I discovered in stories we wrote for the Times. They were advising uh, companies that made the most lethal consumer product in history which is cigarettes. And they did it long after it was well known and established and proven that it was lethal and that the cigarette companies were lying about it. And a federal judge had found them guilty of, of, of RICO violations. The cigarette companies. The cigarette companies. No, oh, did yeah. I say McKinsey? No, just want to be clear. Yeah. Pardon me. No, no. They're, they're totally innocent. It's what no. journalists do. We edit each other. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, 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 I yeah. misspoke. <laughs> I get, I caught, but yes, they, they, they did that. So. Um. Well, and in the I, whole... I, I, I wanted to just say, I mean, so Walt said they did it long after the whole world knew, you know, that, uh, you know, cigarettes were deadly long after, you know, this racketeering charge. How long after? McKinsey worked for tobacco, big tobacco, until 2021. And when we say work for big tobacco, Altria, um, but not just Altria, also British American tobacco, also Imperial tobacco in Japan, yep. Japan tobacco, all of the big guys. And all the vaping, because yeah. that's tobacco too. And uh, they work for Juul. They work for Altria when they were trying to introduce a vaping product. Okay. And we, we say we worked with them. What, what do they do? Well, here's an example. In 2016, around, around 2016, McKinsey was pitching some work with Altria on developing a loyalty program. You know, I don't know why you need a loyalty program for an addictive product, but you know, I, I, yeah. I mean, um, so uh, the, the idea was you're gonna have an app, you know, yeah. your Marlboro app, and the more you smoke, you know, the more trinkets you get, or you can get points to get to buy more smokes and to buy all sorts of other things. And they actually had a mock-up of that, we saw the slide presentation. Um, this is the kind of work they do. They, 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 they do loyalty programs with all sorts of companies, so they take their expertise and their, what they learned from that and they were pitching it to, to Philip Morris. And the Jules example, is that what it's called? Jewel, yeah. Jewel, Jewel, yeah. Where they would um, pay public schools to come in and talk to kids? Get access to the kids, yeah. They About vaping. Yeah, they, they recognized that that was a problem. Well, they they gave the school something like ten thousand dollars. Yeah, well, schools uh, wanted money. Well, I mean, of course. money, money, you know, works in this society. Yeah, sometimes yeah. for the better and sometimes not. Unbelievable. Well, um, that's the the theme that runs through this. I mean, the McKinsey mantra is profits at all costs, and there's example after example of you know the the worst. You know, you hit us right from the start when people dying. I mean. Did any of this shock you guys at any point in terms of the lengths that they'd go to to make money? And the fact that nobody seems to care, or I mean, they're, they're not publicly held. They don't have to file disclosures. No, uh, there's no accountability, um, no regulation, um, which made our job more yeah. difficult but more challenging. Uh, but we were able to be the first people, mm -hmm. the beyond, before the government doesn't have this information, 
We have it. Mm -hmm. We got the, their client list and what they paid McKinsey. And that's how we were able to show the conflicts of interest that they kept hidden. So, yeah. But to answer your question on whether we're shocked, it shocks me every time I learn something new. I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm not numb to it. It just shocks the hell out of me yeah. every time. Well, and so many people didn't even realize their role with big tobacco mm -hmm. until you read it in here, and that it went on for so long. Yeah. In fairness to McKinsey, and we do want to be fair, you know, I know a lot of the people who work there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Obviously not the you know, thousands of them that work there, but I, we, Mike and I have gotten to know a number of them, and they're really good people, mm -hmm. and they care about the world, they care about their neighbors, the kind of people that I would like to have as friends, and in fact do have as friends. So they're not totally evil. They don't wear horns and you know have a tail, and, uh, and some may, but n not everyone. Uh, but it's, uh, it's so, so they're not an evil organization. They do do some good work, but they also do some bad things. And our job was to, to as, a, it, as journalists, we don't report on the planes that don't crash. We report on the ones that do. And McKinsey, in, in so many words, has had quite a few plane crashes. Mm -hmm. It was amazing that you did get as many people to talk to you. And this book is one of the most well uh, end noted, <laughs> if that's a, the term, um, book I've ever seen. And so you were very transparent about the sourcing. One of the times that anybody broke ranks with McKinsey was, you mentioned it in your opening remarks, when people found out what they were doing for immigration uh, services. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we knew this, uh, so we, all we did really for this first story, you know, which was about South Africa, is I think there was what, one paragraph in there? Yeah, yeah. It was about South Africa, but we also wanted to explain what McKinsey was, because right. people didn't know, so we had to give them an overview, and in part of that overview, overview we had one sentence about ICE. Yeah, and so this would have been the summer of 2018, and if you remember, that summer was also the summer where there was the border crisis, you know, where mm -hmm. there was families being separated, and we were hearing those just heart-wrenching stories, you know, even audio of just crying children being separated from their families, lonely, you know, detained, uh, and so this this was really on, you know, the minds of a lot of people, and, you know, in that story, we mentioned just what we knew, which wasn't a lot, we knew that they were doing work and that they were making, you know, because we were looking at federal contracting information, you know, on, um, you know, which is all publicly available, easy to find, um, uh, usaspending.org, or is it com? Yeah, anyway, it's a great website. Um, and those two or three sentences set off a firestorm, not only at McKinsey, but also at Deloitte, which was also doing a lot of this work. And so there was a petition going around at Deloitte Consulting as well. Um, so the company had to issue some statements saying, oh, you know what, that work was just, you know, it was very innocuous, it was just, you know, administrative stuff, and we, by the way, we've ended it. Um, you know, what they didn't say at the time is that it was scheduled to end, um, and as far as it being innocuous, um, uh, we soon learned that that wasn't the case. What, what exactly did they advise? Right, and so this is where, you know, um, we have to credit, uh, our competitors, I guess, ProPublica, they published in the Times, um, uh, but a uh, uh, reporter over there got uh, some FOIA documents that before we did uh, and uh, listed some of the things that um, McKinsey was doing at ICE. And one of the things they were doing is reviewing costs, as McKinsey does, they're big on cost cutting. One of the programs they were looking at cutting and evaluating was food uh, for detainees at the ICE detention centers. He's saying, well, you know, why, is, why are you spending so much on food? That's not the industry standard. You should be spending less on food. That actually upset a lot of people at, at ICE. You know, there's a lot of good people work at ICE, actually. You know, they've been demonized a lot, but there's a lot of, you know, people there. They were really upset. They started talking. Um, one of the things they did, which we're still trying to suss out exactly what they were doing, but uh, we, we rewrite this in the book, is they were trying to speed up the deportation process as well, to get these people who had been detained in the country, get them on a plane, and get them out of America. And they were working with ICE to speed up this whole process. So this really set off um, 
it just really touched a nerve with a lot of people who worked at McKinsey. A lot of people had personal stories of their own relatives or their best friends uh, who had, you know, were either at risk of being deported or their families had been deported. Uh, you know, a lot of people who work at McKinsey are very idealistic. Um, there's a reason for that. McKinsey actually seeks out these people and appeals to them. Um, come work for us instead of going to work for an investment bank because here at McKinsey, you can change the world. Uh, and uh, that's a very appealing sales pitch. These are the types of people, many of which would actually be quite upset to hear that the company they're working for is actually helping uh, get people out of the country faster, to, to, to deport them faster, or thinking about cutting food budgets for detention centers. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the ways we were able to report this book is every time something like this happened, every time we were able to report this, people came to us. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it wasn't just you know, for ICE. They, they knew other things, too. And so it just you know, allowed us to expand the story, mm -hmm. opened up new lines of, of reporting for mm -hmm. us. There are so many examples of where the cost cutting was pretty draconian as a way to improve the bottom line. They were very instrumental in Walmart's ongoing strategy of keep a lot of part-timers, don't pay as generous of health benefits. Can you talk a little bit about what you found? Well, um, that? Walmart, quite a few years ago, um, hired McKinsey to look at their health care costs. At a time, it was very embarrassing for Walmart because a lot of their employees were getting covered through Medicaid. In other words, they weren't earning enough money to buy their own insurance, and they brought McKinsey in there to try and figure out, you know, um, can we do something about this? And McKinsey's solution was that they had concluded that, you know, you have someone who's just hired doing the same job that somebody who's been here for seven years is doing. And yet, there's no difference in the performance other than the people who've been here for seven years make more money. So what do you do? You hire more new workers. We don't want workers. I mean, this is so different than how most corporations work. You want people with experience, who, yeah. who know the field, who, who understand it. That wasn't Walmart's um, approach. Yeah. And so they were recommending all these changes to their health care policy. They were also saying, let's cut profit sharing, let's, let's change the, the insurance programs and, 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 and other things that were um, something that n neither party wanted public, but you know, you know, did become public. I, I brought something, I didn't tell you this is a surprise. You, oh, you, show you, and tell. You handed this to me uh, the other day, which I thought was oh, really yeah, interesting, yeah. that um, now McKinsey's actually hiring from Walmart. Um, they're hiring compliance lawyers from <laughs> Walmart. Because McKinsey is in, for some reason now, McKinsey's in great need for compliance lawyers. Uh, and yeah, so, Walmart's had and some you could get a real bargain. I mean, I'm sure if you, especially if you get them in bulk, uh, yeah. compliance lawyers in bulk, uh, I'm sure you can get a real good bargain. A six from, pack, you know, a six pack of compliance. Maybe Sam's, Sam's Club. Sam's Club. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Sam's it's, Club's it's, where you want to go. We'll sell you um, a yeah. pallet of them. Yeah. yeah. And this is a company, too, though, that does, you know, Walmart, we have to feel sorry for them because they only have more than a billion dollars a day in sales. So, yeah. Okay. Enough of my smart ass remarks. Um, <laughs> Another one that I was, I was really surprised to read about was their role in trying to defang some of the financial regulations that Congress put in place after Enron, which, of course, McKinsey had a role. Yes, the head of Enron, Enron. was the former McKinsey guy. And they had an entire floor of McKinsey of consultants yeah. working there. Yeah. And that didn't turn out so well as it, had, no, as it turned out. No, no, it didn't. Uh, uh, in terms of I, yeah. gutting Sarbanes at right. Moxley, it's so, just like, well, you've got too many regulations here. That's right. So you go back 20 years, and at, in, the, in the wake of the Enron disaster, the WorldCom bankruptcy, all these mm -hmm. things, and, and you know, Congress enacted you know, Sarbanes. Oxley, Oxley tried to you know, prevent these things from happening. And in 2007, uh, McKinsey put together a report on competitiveness of uh, American financial centers, specifically New York. And, and the, the concern was that 
my gosh, you know what? Uh, New York's in danger of losing its position as the global financial capital to, to London and everything. And why is that? Because it's, there's too many regulations. This, remember, 2007. This is a key date here. Uh, you know, and you know, we've got to look at Sarbanes-Oxley and some of these onerous uh, regulations that have been you know, strapped on the, these poor bankers. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and there's this other thing that you know, we're really good at the securitization of assets here in America. We're the world leader. But there's danger on the horizon. Those people in London, you know, not as regulated as us, they, they could become the world leader in asset securitization and all those great things like collateralized debt obligations and those, these wonderful things that have really increased home ownership in America. This is what McKinsey was saying in January 2007. Um, and it was just a few weeks later that some of the big, you know, the cracks really started. The cracks were actually showing even before then. Um, and there were already some, some, some collapses before then, you know. And, you know, at this point in January, February 2007, the really smart money on Wall Street, i.e., Goldman Sachs, they were like, Let's get out. Let's get out. Let's just, you know. Uh, anyway, um, McKinsey. I think one, you know. We always get back to you know what does McKinsey do? I, you know, I want to give you that idea. One of the things McKinsey does is it's a company of ideas. They were a big company of ideas when it came to pharmaceuticals. You know, it was you know a guy Martin Elling right back in two thousand two who came up. You know, really was trying to talk to the industry about targeting specific doctors to, to for for pharmaceutical companies to reimagine their, share, their, their sales practices to, to target you know, high prescription writing doctors. These are big ideas. Same thing. Yeah. Can, can, can I just add yeah. one quick one? Hold it there. Yeah. Um, McKinsey doesn't make anything. It just makes ideas. That's it. Um, Ford makes cars. You know? GM makes cars. They don't make anything. Uh, they sell their ideas. And the more they, they charge, the more people want them. Um, you know, more you know your competitors uh, hiring them, the more you want them. So I, I just wanted to add that. Yeah. So <laughs> so in finance, one of the ideas, and McKinsey didn't invent this idea, but they spread the good news. They they proselytized this idea, and it was the idea of securitization of assets. Uh, so that's where. So for example, in the mortgage industry, you know, if you have a whole bunch of mortgages. You can sell those mortgages to some entity, you know, and bundle them up and then sell that as a security. And it's theoretically a very good investment because people are paying off their mortgages. So it's earning this, you know, steady return. It's a good asset to have. You know, there's whole there's a whole industry around this. There's, you know, Fann Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac were pioneers in this. Uh, in the 80s, um, this started to spread out of home mortgages into other asset classes like car loans and everything. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of Wall Street investment banks like Salomon Brothers uh, and First Boston that were pioneers in this. But then McKinsey started writing books about this and started telling all these other banks, you've got, this is amazing. This, this is, this is going to revolutionize things. In fact, one McKinsey senior partner said, this is the biggest change to finance since the invention of like double entry accounting during the Renaissance, you know. Um, and this, these ideas have power. People listen to McKinsey, and McKinsey got a lot of business helping other banks set up their asset securitization um, divisions. And of course, it, you know, of course, it's not fair to blame McKinsey for the financial crisis, but they were there at the beginning in the 80s, and you know, this securitization process got abused, obviously, in the early 2000s into these, you know, this toxic debt, these crazy, crazy, um, you know kind of, what are they called, Der they're derivatives, but mm -hmm. just synthetic um, CDOs, all these things mm -hmm. that cause the, you know, the main cause of the financial crisis. Which led to the Great Recession, which the General Accounting Office, just to get back to that mm -hmm. whole idea of inequality. I mean, General Accounting Office says that it cost Americans $22 trillion. There's, and the New York Times did a, a great series 10 years after that saying, mm -hmm. how are you doing? And a lot of people still can't get back into a house because yeah. they lost their houses. So again, fueling that inequality, that, that gap. And, and anger. And you wonder why you know, half the nation has lost their mind and mm -hmm. believing things that they 
clearly should know is not are not yeah. true. I mean, it's I can understand the anger, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we're yeah. Time -wise. Okay. Yeah. Well, I want to ask one last okay. question, then we'll open it up. Okay. Um, as you can imagine, um, McKinsey likes to go to schools like ours to recruit mm -hmm. very bright students, um, and they suggest that you can build wealth without guilt, and because we're a values-driven company. What's your advice to our graduates who might be considering McKinsey for a career? Um, I would proceed with caution um, <laughs> and with you know eyes wide open, you know. And I guess it a lot depends on what kind of person you are too. Um, but uh, a lot of people are lured into McKinsey because of their sales pitch that you know, hey, look what we do in Africa. We're helping to spread polio vaccines in Nigeria, and it's a very, very sexy pitch. I, I would ask them. I would read this book, obviously. Please read the book. It's, a, yeah. it's available at Amazon right now. Uh, you, you know, again. I would ask them, how do you explain all these things? What do you say about this, that, and the other things that you've done that have really been harmful to society and to people? Ask them, how do you respond to that, and what are you going to do about it in the future? I mean, what they will say is that you know we've change, we've hired these compliance officers from, from Walmart, <laughs> um, you know, by the dozen, but whatever. Um, I mean, they do, they say they've changed their method of evaluating clients, and, and maybe they have, maybe they haven't. But it certainly bears uh, watching by the media and by people who aren't thinking about going there. McKinsey needs transparency. Society needs them to be transparent. So we know what they're doing. And since they work for the government, we got to know how they're spending you know, the government's money. So these are all things that you know, prospective em employees should keep in mind. Be happy to take some questions at this point. Come on, don't be shy. Yes. Kind of have to be careful there. Uh, you know, um, obviously, uh, most McKinsey uh, employees, when they leave, sign non-disclosure agreements. Um, but I, I could get back to the, the point. You know, where as we were writing stories, more people came to us and inside the company, and they were upset. You know, um, and we just talked to them and talked to people. I think all in all, we've interviewed about a hundred current and former. McKinsey. These are people that signed NDAs that it vowed never to d discuss their business. We got them to talk, but that only happens after years of work and, and knowing our subject matter and using, pressing the right levers to get them to talk. I and mean, that's what journalists do. That's what investigative reporters do. And I was pleased to be working with one of the best here. I think we, uh, I, I think it's safe to say, and Walt's always my governor here like this, don't, don't shut up, Mike, shut up. You know, if I say I talk too much, you know, I can't help it. I would be a terrible company spokesman. I would get fired in a day. It would be yeah, a disaster. Yeah, we all would. Yeah, yeah, you know. But I mean, I think it's safe to say we were kind of surprised when we got the, the company list, the, the, all the client list. That's not something we were soliciting at all. It came to us, uh, and uh, you know, um, and so this was a list of about 2,400 or so of the 2,200 of McKinsey's clients. You know, they're they're and the revenue uh, that McKinsey was getting from them. Um, and that was a, something no one's ever gotten before. And yeah. what was the fallout Their response um, has been measured, as I expected it would be. Um, it's generally, um, w at least to, to the public and to us, is, well, it's unfair. We do a lot of good things, too and you've only emphasized the bad things. Um, and um, we emphasize what we think is newsworthy. And McKinsey has more money than God, and they spend it um, putting out reports on the internet almost t every 10 minutes. 
And so they have a great publicity machine going, but they don't get into this side of the company. Um, we did. Yeah, I brought another, another visual aid. This was a, uh, a letter, a, an internal memo that they put out before our book came out to all the clients. And it's from the head of the managing partner you know, of the company. And uh, he was you know, defending the company's work. You know, That's what one would expect. You know, when, yeah, it's, it's uh, and defend, you know, and uh, I'll just read a sentence. You know, uh, when we have made mistakes in the past, we have been humble about acknowledging them and, whole, and bold about fixing them. On opioids, for example, as I have said before, I wish we could have recognized the unfolding epidemic earlier, stopped our work with manufacturers sooner, and wow. that we had been swifter in implementing additional controls for our client service and selection approach. This would have helped prevent missteps in South Africa. These as are well. really smart people. What do you mean you didn't know this was going? Open your eyes, for God's sake. Read a newspaper. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, these are some of the smartest people in the world. They, you'd think they would have been able to, they're paid to uh, predict. I wish we had known that people were being harmed by opioids. Yeah. Oh my goodness, this game is a great shock to us. Yeah. I guess we'll pay you $600 million to forget about it. Yeah. Mm. Not to be mm. flip about it, but you know, a tragedy, obviously. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. I think we'll both answer that. I'll, I'll give a, an opening comment about it. Um, McKinsey says it's the biggest and the best in the world. And when you say that and you charge for that, um, then you have to account. And we thought we would look at the best and, and the biggest and um, mo you know, most popular. S so we did. And, uh, and I think that that's, that's a legitimate thing to do. Look, the whole consulting world has to account for what they're doing. Um, we focused on the biggest, but others, I think, need scrutiny as well. Yeah, and when you say the biggest, we mean among these peer management consulting companies, so it's the MBB, McKinsey, Bain, and Boston Consulting Group. Um, through these several years uh, that we've been writing, um, we've actually written um, two stories about Boston Consulting Group. We set out to do something on McKinsey, the McKinsey story we thought we had to do, we we're gonna write, actually turned into more of a Boston Consulting Group story. Boston Consulting Group is very big in Saudi Arabia, worked very closely with Mohammed bin Salman's people, the, the crown prince, the guy who ordered the killing of uh, the journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, so they're very big in Saudi Arabia. Um, they're also really big in Angola. They were working with the previous, the, the, the daughter of the previous very corrupt uh, president of, of Angola. That is, um, McKinsey was, but Boston Consulting even more so. So what I'm trying to say is, these other ones are similar as, they, they're, they're similar in many ways to McKinsey. Um, but McKinsey's the leader. McKinsey's the alpha dog of these. And you, you really do want to focus on the leader. Bain is in a lot of trouble in South Africa as well. Um, they did some, you know, some stuff, I think, with the taxation and yeah. finance ministry that has gotten a lot of media attention, including in the New York Times. So it's, they are similar. Um, but like I said, when you're going to tackle the industry, you have to choose your targets, I think, sometimes and focus. And, so we focused on, you know, the alpha dog. Uh, thank you all for coming. I think this is great for everyone listening in this. I really love the floor consulting. Uh, is this a used consulting piece here? And what's your recommendation? Well, we're not editorial writers. <laughs> and we try and be very careful about that. Um, and we haven't so far, except to say some of the more obvious things, which is more transparency, more accountability. Uh, Government should be doing a better job of monitoring these centers of power uh, and demanding accountability. Um, that sunlight, you know, disinfects a lot of things. Um, McKinsey needs a lot of sunlight. And, and there may be change. I mean, it is bipartisan in some ways. You know, not a lot of bipartisan issues in Congress. And 
It's bipartisan for different reasons. You know, I think there's a lot of Republicans very concerned about McKinsey's work with China, including Senator Marco Rubio. And then on the Democratic side, there's a lot of uh, lawmakers very concerned about the conflict of interest with the FDA work uh, and McKinsey. And, and one thing we didn't say, some of those people who are working for Purdue Pharma and other opioid makers, the same people were, you know, then worked at the F, for the FDA, what, McKinsey, on a McKinsey project at the FDA, the very same people. Uh, mm. it was, that's actually, that came out after our book was written, oh. uh, but uh, we wrote about it in the Times. So. It'll be in the paperback version. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, one thing that occurs to me, too, is you use the example of interviewing employees at Disney, and they, and, and they ask, why are you wasting time checking the lap bars every day? It's that like, was one of my favorite lines. <laughs> listen to the employees when yeah. they do their jobs. They'll, they might tell you yeah, something. Yeah, well, they're really not, I mean, in my view, that interested in what the employees have to say. They're Clearly, interested in yeah. what the CEO has to say and why they hired them. Mm -hmm. And they hired them to cut costs. And you can talk to all the you know, employees till you're blue in the face, but you might not be listening to them. They're gonna be doing, which is often why companies hire McKinsey, to make the unpopular decisions mm -hmm. that the CEOs don't want on their shoulders. Yeah. I should have given us more. No, no, yeah, so, no, that was it's nice of them. Yeah. Uh, so which, which is more annoying to them, all the individual documentation of all these, these stories, or the fact that now this name is out there that they like to stay under the radar and nobody knows? Tough question. It is. Um, I, I, think, I think it's that the name is out there and people now know who they are um, then that they're worthy of being watched. You know, they operate best in the, in, in the dark, um, at least as far as the public is concerned. Um, and um, to show, shine light on them, it, that's what we do as journalists. And, and there's consequences for them. Now, you, you say there's a huge scandal right now, a huge uproar in France over their work and their influence uh, over politics and government in France. And now in Canada too, uh, just over the last few weeks, um, new revelations about the extent of their, you know, government contracts that they're getting there. Um, so it's not just America. You know, it's there's a lot more awareness of McKinsey, and uh, so we think our reporting has triggered other reporting around the world, and 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 that's encouraging. And it's a global company, as we've discussed, and it was really, you know, encouraging for us to know that. We, you know, 10 different countries bought publishing rights, um, which indicates their reach and the concern of, of the publishing industry to try and to tell the story. I mean, I think as a journalist, I feel a little uncomfortable yeah. about that term call to action. I think there's a lot of people who their job would be to do something like that, maybe in you know, public advocacy you know, in, a, in a nonprofit. You know. I, and I don't mean that as a cop-out answer. Um, all we can do is keep writing. And, and, uh, but I think you know, there's, a, there's a line you don't want to cross between writing and, and then lobbying. And, and when I say lobbying, I don't mean in the bad sense. I mean advocacy. You know, mm. and, you know, raising awareness. Uh, I, I do feel yeah. comfortable talking about more accountability. That's what we need. And, and, and that's as a citizen of this country, you know, uh, and it, beyond just being a journalist. I mean, we should demand that as a society, that you have this incredibly powerful institution that is accountable to nobody. Well, that should change. I'm, ha I'm comfortable in making that mm -hmm. but I, call I, to action. I do hope more journalists, you know, take up the flag and, and, and keep the story burning. And they have all sorts of skills that we don't have and sources and knowledge that we don't have. And so who knows what's gonna pop up next. Yeah. 
I don't know. I guess they have a 15% minimum now, huh? Um, but that, but uh, yeah, I, I have no idea uh, what that would be an interesting yeah, thing to look at. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, the New York Times does have a rich history of people just dropping off tax returns, you know, yeah. <laughs> unsolicited. But those were your colleagues. So who else? Yes. That's a, an interesting question. Um, I don't think you can justify in any way, shape, or form the, 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 the damage that they've done to so many lives, no matter how many good things they've done. I mean, look, I don't mean to overdraw this comparison. I mean, they're not the mafia. I understood that I did cover the mafia for many years early in my career. And one of the things they did was they gave away free turkeys and free food. And oh, we're, we're, you know, we're really good. And then they go kill people. So, you know, I mean, I don't think you can, you know, the good balances out the bad. But they should be acknowledged and praised for the good things that they do. And, 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 and we did say that they do good things. And I will repeat that here. For the record, they do good things. Mm -hmm. Was the mafia coverage when you were in Cleveland or New York? When I was in Cleveland. I was going to say, it sounds like Cleveland in the old days. Yeah. Oh, yeah. believe me. Yeah, uh, yeah good times. <laughs> I mean, we, there's, if you look at it, it's actually, I think it's 1,200 footnotes, actually. You know, and uh, we, you know, we just wanted to make sure we documented everything, right? Uh, and, you know, and when you say creative nonfiction, it wasn't all that creative. No, but, <laughs> you know, but we wrote what we We, we understand knew. the point. I yeah. mean, people won't read um, what you find if you don't tell it in a nice story. Uh, I worked for 60 Minutes for, for many years, and Don Hewitt, the founder of that, he always say, tell me a story, mm -hmm. tell me a story. If you don't tell people a good story, they're not going to read it. So it's got to have a, a literary quality to it. I don't mean to suggest that we're like, <laughs> that we're to be praised for our, our brilliance in writing. I mean, we tried to make it readable, and, and I, I think you know, we did, but um, yeah. But, but I mean, as far as sourcing goes, if you look you know, at the footnotes, it's, it's all sorts of sources. A lot of interviews, obviously. Um, and I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the ways we got a lot of these interviews is basically using LinkedIn. I mean, it sounds so boring and, and so obvious, but uh, McKinsey people love LinkedIn. And yeah. uh, yeah. they love it. And so I spent a ridiculous amount of time yeah, trolling on LinkedIn, and, and we yeah. develop sources that way. Uh, and, uh, but then, you know, Freedom of Information Act, you know, to get the documents. Um, the, the, the lawsuits, uh, lawsuits are amazing, uh, you know. When there you weren't that them. many of them. But, but there were some important ones, like yeah, the opioid I, one, you know. Um, yeah, that was a crim that was a, a criminal, you know, yeah. investigation. But uh, but it's a I think it's good to look in the footnotes or end notes because yeah. it'll give you a good idea of our sources, you know, and you know it's so they're not the most again. scintillating part of the book, yeah. the end notes, shall we say? Yeah. But uh, nor was it a scintillating experience writing them. Believe me. Yeah. You you do all this work. And, okay, now you got to do the end notes. Oh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Give me another drink. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, last question here. I'm curious, you know, you guys have talked quite a bit about how you were the first even foreign government agency to get a lot of information on Cindy. And I guess I'm just kind of wondering, you know, why did it take so long for people like this to mount this serious and iconic building project, you know, for a multinational corporation that's been around for decades? Why did it take so long? Because they're so good at their entire business model, which is built on secrecy. And it's intimidating to reporters. I mean, you've got to sell your editors on this. You, you know, who, what editors are going to say, oh, go ahead, take as long as you need to like, pierce this company that nobody has ever pierced before. 
Uh, the government has never really tried to get this information. I'm not sure they could if they wanted. Um, so again, it comes back to transparency, put facts out there for the public and let the public react, let other journalists, journalists react and, and maybe some good will come of it. And, I, I, and this, is, this sounds so prosaic, you know, it's just, there's a lot of stories in the world mm. and uh, journalists have to take, you know, pick their targets carefully sometimes, and it was McKinsey's turn, I guess. You know, we were able, we were able to do that, thanks to Walt, you know, getting it started. Uh, and maybe the explanation for why it hasn't really been held account before is that, you know, uh, journalists were doing other things, you know, yeah. and were exposing other companies. Is that fair, Walt? Mm, mm. No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think there was enough time in their day to look at McKinsey, too. Um, I think they just bought you know, the line that this was a great company mm. and, and they didn't look behind it. And that's what investigative reporters are supposed to do. They're supposed to challenge the conventional wisdom. And, and it, to be honest, it took me several years at the New York Times to convince the editors to give me the resources to go after this story. And I could kind of understand it, you know? I mean, if I'm an editor, I want results right away. And I, you know, I, I, want, I want to put my money on, it, on, the, on the chip, on the, you know, the numbers that are most likely to come home and produce a payoff. But it wasn't until I you know, found Mike um, uh, that we kind of had a critical mass and, um, and decided to get more aggressive in um, getting the, the green light from our editors. And, and, and it's not like McKinsey hasn't been written about before. You know, it's been written about you know, for decades. But and one would think that actually a time that maybe some reporters should have really spent some quality time on it is, is after the Enron collapse, when mm -hmm. you know, the, the McKinsey fingerprints were all over that. Uh, and it was written about, but there was you know, only so far, I guess. You know, no real in-depth investigation. It wasn't, the focus wasn't on McKinsey. Yeah. Um, you know, I we wrote a chapter called the, the en Enron Astros. What was the name of it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, they, not surprisingly, whenever you see some kind of disaster, they, you know, McKinsey will be there. I mean, they were advising the Astros. I don't think they were telling me you gotta bang really hard, you know, to, to you know, do extra hard and use this, you know. But, but they created a culture of win it all, at all costs. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's how they approach things. And, and where did that general manager, Jeff Luno, come from? He came from McKinsey. <laughs> yeah. Ah, good, good way to end this. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Just one more thing, their book is for sale in the lobby and these guys will be here for a little bit if you want them to sign it or if you just want to say hi. Thank you all very much for Thanks. coming.